welcome back. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, Chris was super excited. <laughs> Had a very oh. long, a long, long week. <laughs> I feel like the sigh was needed. Yes. <laughs> Everyone, let's just sigh together now. <sighs> Actually, it does feel better. <laughs> it does. It does. It's a, it's a nice way of saying, fuck you week, you're almost over. <laughs> yes. It's Friday Eve. <laughs> it's Friday Eve. Yes, that's great. Uh, Friday Eve before vacation. Oh, I know. You lucky duck. <laughs> I know. I mean, I still have to go on and do a couple things during the week, but only like one or two. Most of it is nothing. So I told, I told our coworker, please don't message me. <laughs> Ever. <laughs> Ever again. <laughs> That'll be nice. This have is some... not serving as my work notice. Please don't take it as such. <laughs> <laughs> do you have any big plans? I guess there's not really much going on. The world's closed. But I do. Well, what's your plan? <laughs> my basement has walls. <gasps> really? I've been working on this basement, guys, for over a year. And I say I, I mean my husband, who I love dearly, <laughs> yep so he we finally put up the walls we have the second coat of putty on he says it should be good after the next one yay uh so yeah so i will be painting that's what uh, did you pick your color already i i picked gray that's the thing now but there's a lot of grays like it i really is <laughs> overwhelming a lot and then there's like greeny grays and purple grays right. and blue grays well, and gray that's, grays <laughs> that's the thing with gray is you can't just have gray you have to pick your undertone yeah so if you pick purple then it's too girly <laughs> if you pick blue then it looks a little bleh yeah. if you pick green it looks like puke like there's <laughs> clearly we're not there yet <laughs> <laughs> okay well that's the fun part but the walls are up Yay, the walls are up. That's exciting. <laughs> and I have cabinets for my... I am a crafter, guys. I like to make all the crafts. Um, and I have cabinets. So now I just need a countertop. Ooh, where do you find time to craft? I don't... <laughs> yeah, I haven't lately. <laughs> you should write a book on, like, how to organize your time properly. <laughs> and I would probably never get around to reading it. <laughs> but the idea would be there. <laughs> so if I were to draw a picture of how to organize your life... I would give Emma a crayon, and that's what it would look like, because that's what I do. Okay, well, you do a good job. There's a little bit over here and a little bit over there. Nothing's all done until it has to be. Yeah, that's me, as I finished my notes this evening after yes. delivering these papers. That's okay. I had picked my person I was going to do my case on, and I didn't touch it again until yesterday. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we are one and the same. A <laughs> little bit, a little bit. I am like the OCD. I have to have everything done, but I procrastinate to the last second. I know. I'm a terrible procrastinator. Mm -hmm. I just do it all the time. And like, that stresses me out, but yet I'm not ready to change. <laughs> so it's like this vicious cycle of procrastination that just never ends because I can't You need to be ready to change. Yeah, I'm not. I'm no. really not. No. I, like, for some reason, <laughs> like to live in chaos. My alarm goes off, like, just before I'm supposed to be getting out the door. And then I'm running around, making lunch, like, freaking out, like, we're late! And Dom's like, it's your fault! <laughs> I'm like, My I'm husband aware. is like that. <laughs> My husband is like that. I set the alarm at, like, I'm not kidding, quarter to six. Ew. Yeah. But then I, <laughs> then it goes off again at six. Okay. And then six ten. And then six twenty. And then so 6.30. The intention's there. The intention is there. We get up by 6.30. We get the kids up. And then it's like quarter after 7. The kids have eaten. They haven't put their boots on yet, but he has to be gone by like 7.25. He'll still be naked. <laughs> <laughs> but somehow it's the kids' fault. <laughs> get your damn boots on, Rob. Get your pants on. <laughs> right. <laughs> Priorities. <laughs> At least they've got their pants. Yes. Yeah. So he does the same thing. He he leaves everything to the last minute. But <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, well, hopefully him and I will never organize anything together. Please don't. It will never happen. <laughs> <laughs> oh lord. Oh jeez. Uh. So oh, I don't think we said it, but oh, yeah. I'm Sheena. I'm Crystal. <laughs> and this is Narrow Squeak. Yay! <laughs> Thanks for uh, listening to all of that prior to telling you what this was. If you're just tuning in, um, that is kind of just how we do things. A little bit. Uh, so this week we decided to go with Crimes of Passion. Um, so I think it kind of shifted though. I think a little bit. Well, the crime, the definitions kind of, like can be kind of loose, I guess. Like basically, it's just your emotional 
could, like, it just takes over and you react kind of thing, yeah. usually. But most of the time, like, when I originally thought of Karma Passion, it was, like, a heat of the moment, something that happened. But yeah. I kind of, as I normally do, veered off a little bit from that. <laughs> but in my defense, in my defense, I found this case on the Crimes of Passion podcast. Therefore, okay. I think it still fits the bill. <laughs> All right. Well, mine is, it is, so I think we should just say that we went with couples. <laughs> yes. Couples. Because mine, there was, yeah, like, there was some passion to it. But then by the time the crime happened, it, wasn't it was like a couple hours later. <laughs> yeah. So you probably had time to, like, get yourself in check. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so this week for my updates, I'm sure you've seen it, but the Sarah Everard uh, mm-hmm. murder in London. Dude, I've I've been so deep in work, so uh, I haven't looked at anything. So this actually, this is super frustrating for me. Um, it was a woman, and basically the way that it was handled is what pisses me off. Mm. So it was a woman in London, and she was walking through a park, well lit, dressed in... England or Ontario? England. Um, well lit path, on the phone with her boyfriend... I have wearing, seen something on social yeah. media about this, but not a lot. Wearing bright colored clothing, like everything you're supposed to do as a woman, which in itself is shit. <laughs> and she was still abducted. And she was abducted and murdered by a police officer, an active police officer. Oh. Um, her body was missing for nine days. And the UK, po- like the police department, had the fucking audacity to ask women to stay home or to not go out at night by themselves. Like, that is a culture that needs to shift completely, because why are we, like, what are the 1970s? Like, hello, why are we not addressing the actual problems? And then there was some, like, a vigil, and it turned into police brutality. Like, the, there's videos of the police officers throwing women to the ground that were peacefully protesting, like, what the, f- like, you know what I mean? So the whole thing, like, Aww. just was mishandled completely, and just kind of highlights, again, some of the issues in yeah. our societies, so... Um, yeah, it's super, it's super upsetting. That's depressing. It's extremely depressing. And just the way that it's been handled and like, there's pictures of women like on the ground with police, like on them. And it's just like, that is exactly what is not supposed to be happening. It's it's crazy because when you think of those cases, like clearly the other officers in the situation are dealing with shit. Like they are dealing with a shit storm that they didn't create, but then stuff like this, like it's like they they forget how to react to anything and they just brutalize they're just act like, like idiots like they just i don't understand <laughs> and it's not obviously not every single person but no just as a whole like you know and you know the riots that were happening last year and it's just kind of like this is not the way things need to be handled and we need to really look at it but again with this culture of women having to still protect themselves and i mean that's <laughs> That's why we still have a podcast, but like, it's like it's awful, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so that's something that kinda got my blood boiling and then the uh Atlanta shooting um at the I feel like I live under a rock. <laughs> well, actually I just kind of I have people because I like work at a women's shelter, so uh, the people I have on my Facebook are right. often sharing kind of this women's rights type thing. So that's sort of how it comes my way. Um, and it's those posts that I pay attention to right. rather than the news at first. But um, anyways, a white male in Atlanta targeted three different massage parlors and oh. shot um, Asian women. And his and they're tr- still trying to justify saying that this wasn't a racially derived crime, which is super upsetting. <laughs> <laughs> and obviously I'm a little heated about this stuff. <laughs> but, and they're saying they're not sure if it's racially motivated. Um, and the police officer actually said he was having a really bad day. I'm, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> like, no. I have a lot of really fucking bad days and I don't go and <laughs> shoot people. No. Um, his reason was that he was a sex addict and they were the problem for him, which comes back to the hypersexuality of Asian women. And it's just, anyway, yeah. so. That sounds very much like a just... serial killer. It, well, I guess if he shot. It, it was a, a spree. spree shooting. Oh. Yeah, like all at once, but. Anyways, so I I know that there's four dead for sure. I wow. think there was eight women shot, and six of them were um, of Asian descent. But anyways, I just it's <laughs> that's my updates. Not <laughs> not fun, but um, pretty upsetting. Um. So 
You do have some exciting news, though. <gasps> I do! Okay. So, for, <laughs> for our listeners, Sheena is about to find out the gender of her kittens. <gasps> it's a gender reveal, everyone. It's a gender reveal. <laughs> they are the same. What are they? They are boys. They're both boys? They are boys. Okay, so I do definitely have to get them fixed. She says she's not 100%, but she's almost positive. Okay. So, well, there my, we go. My girlfriend works in a vet office. And Sheena was not sure um, whether they were boys or girls, <laughs> so we took some very uh, we took some cat porn. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, my poor cats. I had to hold them with their tail in the air while Crystal got in there with her phone and waved it like photos. she just don't care. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so they're both boys. They are right. both boys. She thinks so. At least it's a little cheaper on the spaying or yeah, neutering, neutering. I guess neutering, neutering. Yes. Um, okay. Well. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. And they have boy names, so that's... Good. They do. They Marv are. and Roscoe. Yeah. Um, Marv is just so pretty, though. <laughs> the darker gray? No, the stripy one. Like, oh, yeah. Pretty little eyes and, like, a dainty little face. Oh, see, I, like their, I like the other one. I love them both, but <laughs> Marv, I just like... I'm like, Marv, you little princess. <laughs> and like, people, if you don't know who we're talking about, you should check out Instagram, because Sheena has been posting little <laughs> clips of her study buddies. <laughs> yes, I have. <laughs> They're... They're um, so cute. Yeah, they're quite fun. So I'm sorry, I'm the crazy cat lady now in the podcast world as well as my own. I will tone <laughs> it down eventually, I swear. I'm just really excited. Yay! That's <laughs> exciting. Okay, well, I'm excited to hear your story. Okay. Actually, because uh, you're like someone famous. Yes. But people don't know if they're, don't, may not know that they're dead. And I'm like, what? Is yeah. So, so like, I've been kind of puzzled about this. So guys, I so my story this week, I went with Phil Hartman's murder. I don't know who he is. I knew oh. you would know who he was. <laughs> it's like, but I you don't know do. Who that is. Okay. You do know who okay. he is. He it was he's a staple of my childhood and I had no idea okay. until I started studying this because okay, when I first looked at this case, I saw a picture of him. I'm like, "Oh, I didn't know that guy was dead." And then I read it and I'm like, "Oh, he was so relevant in the 80s and 90s and very much a part of everything and so (laughs) i didn't realize that until i started studying this and i'm like okay this is a good story so i'm gonna tell you a little bit about phil okay uh phil hartman was born september 24th 1948 he was born in brantford ontario so he is canadian uh and when he was 10 years old him and his family moved to the u.s uh, they moved around a bit from, they moved from like Maine to Connecticut and then they ended up on the West Coast and that was where they stayed. Uh, Phil was the fourth of eight children. He, so he's got a really Dang. big family. Dang, parents were busy. I know, I, like I'm the oldest of five on my mom, of my mom's kids and my dad has two others so I've, so I'm one of seven. But uh, not all together with both parents. These were oh, both parents all together. Oh, I know. My dad probably had like nine kids, but <laughs> not all. Like, that was another Wait, That's a whole other. That's a whole other podcast. We could Back do a story. whole episode. <laughs> we could do origin story episodes. You'd be traumatized, guys. <laughs> yes, that's why we're a little you know, dark yeah. now. There's a reason we are who we are. <laughs> Anyways, good day. Anyway. <laughs> Big family. Big family. So then he went on to go to university and chose to go to California State, where he got a degree in graphic arts, which is something he kept a passion for through the rest of his life, but didn't really go into. Uh, After school, he designed the cover art for a bunch of bands, and it's like, it listed a bunch of bands that were supposed to be like, oh, he did the cover art for this. Did you know he did the cover art for this? I'm like, I don't even know who these people oh, are. <laughs> the like 80s bands or something? Yeah, okay. one was called Paco. Damn. Yeah. <laughs> and one was called America. <laughs> All right. Um, so I guess uh, one in 1975, he joined a comedy troupe called The Groundlings. And literally, like, he was watching the show, and it's like an improv show. Oh, like. Yeah. Why I visit anyway. Yeah. So it was an improv show, and he just jumped on stage, <laughs> and then he and became it... like he started out became like a bit of their groupie and started doing some of their um, media stuff and and redesigning their logo and stuff. And then he finally became an actual member in 1975. That's when he became the member. And this is where he meets Paul Rubens. 
Do you know who Paul Rubens is? I don't. Yes, you do. <laughs> is it okay if I Google these people while you do this? You don't need to. I'm okay. going to tell you. Okay. <laughs> it's Pee Wee Herman. What? Okay, so what was Pee Wee Herman? Paul Rubens. Not, so the guy that died, n- not No, what, what was the... Paul Rubens. Link between those two? They both were in this comedy. Oh, this okay. Sketch comedy. Okay. Uh, improv team. Okay. So then uh, he even co-wrote Pee Wee's Big Adventure. And appeared in multiple episodes of Pee-wee's Playhouse as the captain. I fucking hate Pee-wee Herman. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not sure I've ever watched his episodes. I did like, as a kid. I guess my dad told I me when I was little I liked face, it. I can but, like, I don't think I've ever... Yeah, it's... It doesn't seem like it would kind of be my jam, even as a young kid, so... Apparently he was mine, but he now I... Jam. <laughs> apparently, when I was, like, three or... Uh, whatever... Oh. Anyway, yeah. my dad says that I like Pee Wee Herman, and I look at him now, and it's like, you're disgusting. <laughs> I couldn't. <Pee-wee. laughs> we, Rob tried to put on Pee Wee's Big Adventure for Parker when he was a little kid, and I'm like, you have to turn this off. This is awful. <laughs> I'm not sitting through this. <laughs> no, exactly. Uh, so he ended up actually leaving Pee Wee's show, quoting creative differences with Paul Rubens himself. So uh, my theory is that he secretly hated him, too. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> it's like, everyone hates him like the Rick Rowling guy <laughs> so in his career though not only did he go on to do other acting stuff but he is probably the voice of your childhood that you just don't realize he was a voice on the Smurfs he was a voice in Scooby-Doo and Dennis the Menace and I'm gonna, I'm gonna I'll do a fuller list later Okay. but uh, yeah so then he d- appeared in Jumping Jack Flash with Whoopi Goldberg. Oh, okay. I've seen that. And then Three Amigos, which I think was Robin Williams. I can't remember. And I didn't look. I wish I had. I looked up Jumping Jack Flash and then I got distracted. (laughs) Didn't look up Three Amigos. Okay. In 1986, he was asked to, he auditioned and then was asked to join this, the cast of SNL. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, This, he became well known for doing impressions and was on the show for eight seasons. And he even won a primetime Emmy for it in 1989. Uh, one of his recurring impressions that he did on the show was of Bill Clinton. And he actually got a letter because Bill Clinton was the president at the time. Oh, he, he actually got a that. no. Oh, he got a letter from him saying that he that he praised his uh, reenactment and said he played uh, he played a an OK, mostly uh, president. <laughs> yeah so yeah. he also did Bill. <laughs> yeah and I, he actually did an impersonation i just found it the other night i was watching yeah. uh, he did an impersonation of trump too not like A you're talking in like late yeah. 80s <laughs> still same trump though yeah. <laughs> some people just never change some things never change uh so adam apparently adam sandler or Jan Hooks, which was another person in Saturday Night Live. There's dispute about which one of them actually named him this, but they nicknamed him the glue because he was the glue that held the cast together. He was just that guy. Oh. Wow. Yeah. And um, Phil Hartman. Right? He worked alongside other big names like Dennis Miller, Dana Carvey, John Lovitz. I saw John Lovitz. Sorry, Squirrel. I saw him in Syracuse and he was actually hilarious. I never thought I, I would have... like him. I hated his face and, like, friends and everything else, but his stand-up was friggin' gold. It so, was so good. Here's the thing. I have always, like, John Lovitz, if you're listening to this someday in the future when we're maybe famous. Oh, we're super famous. We're super famous, and someone says, hey, did you know those girls talked about you years ago? Uh, I hated him. Oh, like, Sheena loves you. <laughs> hold on, though. At the end of the story, I hate you a lot less. Okay. Because, uh, I'll, I'll get to that part, but... Uh, he is that guy in stuff that I see him come on and I cringe. cringe. I know. I, I was like, too. Oh, oh, I don't like you, John Lovitz. <laughs> if you ever have a chance to watch one of his stand-ups, uh, if he has any recorded ones, and I honestly, should. it was that like it was actually I was crying, like I was laughing so hard, so it was actually good. But I, I get the cringe. <laughs> yeah, and I've actually heard that about him. I've heard that he's actually really funny in his stand-up. Um, <laughs> Sorry, but I just can't do it. I can't because I just. I just don't want... <laughs> Fair um, enough. <laughs> so, during that time he was on SNL, uh, Jay Leno even asked him to come over to The Tonight Show and be his sidekick, which I ended up... I think he ended up 
it might have been Andy Richter, I think. I don't remember. I can't remember <laughs> if he was John Jay Leno's or anyway. Uh, he declined and decided to stay with SNL. Wow. Uh, when he did finally leave SNL, it was for a show called News Radio, uh, which I didn't remember I actually watched as a kid. But it was like this office show. It was one of the first ones where um, people were all just working within the office. And he was just this dick. <laughs> <laughs> he just played a dick. <laughs> uh, and in the background, while all of this guy was, all of this was going on, um, I, I wrote here in the background because this guy wasn't already all over everything. Uh-huh. Uh, Phil was also a voice actor for none other than the biggest adult cartoon of all time. South Park? Oh my gosh. I don't Sheena. know. <laughs> yeah, what's the biggest one? <laughs> I, I'm not going to get it with you staring at me. <laughs> uh, okay, so you people that are sitting there screaming at Sheena, <laughs> it's The Simpsons. Simpsons! <laughs> I, I, I didn't consider that an adult show. I know it. <laughs> that, that's where we miss it. I was, I was watching it when I was quite young. <laughs> so was I. I think everyone okay. was. Um, but I, I can see it. Yeah, okay. So he was the voice of Lionel Hutz and none other than Troy McClure. Interesting. Yeah. And you can't say Troy McClure without saying, Hi, so, I'm Troy, Troy McClure. McClure. <laughs> you may remember me. <laughs> uh, anyway, so uh, he also was the voice of like, half of the one-offs on the show so if you had characters that came in and out <laughs> half the time it was him wow yeah he really just did it all he did all and if it wasn't him it was hank azalea who's still on wow. <laughs> <laughs> i love him i don't know who he is either. oh my I'm god like, i'm just uh, uh, i am under the rock now <laughs> okay you know the movie uh, along came polly yes he was the he's the guy he's the guy on the boat Oh, okay, I do That know is him. Hank Azalea. He's him. been in a lot of other things, okay. too. Um, but I love him. I think he's just so funny. And uh, he's in Ray Donovan in the most recent episodes that we were watching, too. Oh, okay. He's really, really <laughs> funny. Uh, but he's the other half of the voice. <laughs> <laughs> so it's one of the two. Yeah. Uh, so then he was even quoted as saying that his favorite role he ever did was Troy McClure because he was just fun. Like, he just, he did it for fun. He didn't do it because of the money for Tro- to play Troy McClure. Um, this is just a snippet of his life's work, of course. He also appeared in movies like House Guest, Coneheads, So I Married an Axe Murderer, Small Sol- Soldiers, and of course he was that dickhead neighbor creeping up, uh, creeping up on Car- uh, Arnold's wife in Jingle All the Way. <laughs> he was the neighbor. Okay. <laughs> now do you picture him? Yes, I can yeah. picture him now. <laughs> okay. So while he had a tendency to play the cocky or jerk type of character, this couldn't be further from his real life personality, which was said to be very laid back, low key, and an all around decent guy. He enjoyed playing these roles because they were so fun for him. They were so different from his real life. Um, He also said he'd like to, he liked being the supporting lead and not the headliner because if the movie sucked, it wasn't his fault. (laughs) (laughs) I feel that, Phil. (laughs) I know, right? (laughs) Uh, on the personal side of his life, though, Phil married Gretchen Lewis in 1970, but they divorced within two years. Ten years later, he married Lisa Strain, who was a real estate agent, and that marriage lasted for about three years. Uh, Lisa later on in life claimed that he was a very withdrawn and reclusive person, liked to keep to himself, and didn't really open up in the relationship, which is part of why they never really uh, compa- were compatible. And then in 1987, he married Bryn Omdahl. Uh, She was an aspiring actress that he had met on a blind date. Uh, A year after meeting, they got married. And together they had two children named Bergen and Sean. Uh, One of the clips I watched of him in his interviews, he was bragging to Rosie O'Donnell about Bergen. And just his kids were his life. You could see it on his face, in his eyes. He was just in love with his kids. Uh, which was really sweet to see. While they loved each other, him and Bryn, it was hard It was hard for Bryn to see Phil succeed because she was trying to get into the acting scene as herself. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it was hard for her to see him be so successful, and she was struggling. Um, she had previously been a model, but she was wanting to move into that different world. Uh, in This turned into like her becoming very ag- uh, possessive of him, and he, there's claims that she made threats against his ex-wife that she'd gouge her eyes out and stuff. Oh, wait. Okay. Uh, yeah. And she also had written threatening letters to his co-star, 
Jan hooks, but they never got sent. Like they they were found later. Later. Wow. <laughs> she she sounds like a delight. <laughs> yeah, not so much. <laughs> not so much. Uh, there's also reports that he she was abusive towards him, and her jealousy of him and his career was so bad he considered quitting to make just to make her happy. Uh, he so he tried to support her acting goals as well, but the problem was she was starting to use uh, abuse alcohol and drugs. And she was in and out of rehab quite a bit. Mm. Frequently, they'd have to send their kids to other family members so that while they were fighting, because it became so um, toxic at the time, like it was really not a safe environment, so they'd send the kids away. Damn. I hope when I touch the bed, I'm not rocking it. Then <laughs> that sounds bad. <laughs> I was like, they're going to wonder. <laughs> the microphone is not the, on the bed, not us. Uh. <laughs> Um, so on May 27th, 1998, Bryn went to dinner with a friend and had a good night. The friend said nothing seemed out of the ordinary and she was well-minded at the time. When she came home, though, her and Phil started fighting. They had a heated argument after which Bill or Phil went to bed. And from what she said, like it wasn't resolved. He just said, I'm done fighting and went to bed. So at 3 a.m., Bryn walked into his, their bedroom and shot Phil three times, once between the eyes, once in the throat, and once in the chest with a thirty eight caliber handgun. Damn, Bryn. Yeah. Uh, at the time of the murder, Bryn was on Zoloft. She was using cocaine and had alcohol in her system. After the shooting, Bryn drove to her friend Ron Douglas's house and confessed what she had done. He at first laughed it off. But when she maintained her story, he drove to the house separately from her because who's going to yeah. drive in a car with a woman who just said she killed her husband? <laughs> yeah. I'll catch my own ride. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm good. You, so we're it's no really car, unstable right now. There, there's no carpooling here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> During the drive, though, she actually called someone else and confessed as well. So there was a second person that was told. Damn. When they got there, Ron did come in and found Phil and immediately called 911. Um, but at this point, it was 6 o'clock in the morning. It had already been three hours. It was too late. Um, he, oh, was, he was just left there. She just, yeah. Uh, when the police came, they removed the children who were at home for this particular night. Uh, it's unclear. I couldn't really find whether the kids, I don't think they would have known what happened. Like, I imagine there would have been a lot more. They didn't hear the gunshot, though? I don't know. It's 3 a.m., and if your parents are frequently fighting in the middle of the night, sometimes you just, maybe you don't. Yes. Or you Damn. stay in bed and... Yeah. Right? I'm a little unstable right now. Stay yeah. in the room. Well... Damn. So they removed the children and Ron, the friend, from the property, but they couldn't apprehend Bryn because she had actually locked herself in the bedroom with Phil's body. Not long after that, she shot herself. Oh, my God. Yeah. Uh, so... Bryn's oh, four children. I know. It's so hard. Uh, uh, so Bryn's friend said that, that anger was an issue for her and she had always struggled to control it. And Bryn's brother actually later filed a wrongful death suit against Pfizer, as well as her child psychi- the child psychiatrist who had given her the samples of Zoloft. Um, and they settled out of court. So it doesn't really say what happened there, but clearly they took some responsibility. Uh, Phil's death, this is where it gets fun. Not fun, but because this is <laughs> awful. This is so awful. And, and it actually started breaking my heart because I, I, the more I realized he was a part of of uh, things that I knew about, it started to make me really sad. <laughs> uh-huh. um, but Phil's death caused some discord in the acting community. John Lovitz openly accused Andy Dick of playing a role in Phil's death because he said that Andy was the one that reintroduced Bryn to cocaine after she had left rehab. Um, Andy says that he had nothing to do with it. It wasn't his fault. But a year later, that conflict between Lovitz and Dick came. <laughs> Dick. Lovitz and Dick. Lovitz and Dick. <laughs> Lovitz Dick. <laughs> came to a head because they were at the Laugh Factory and they had gotten into a verbal altercation, which led to Lovitz <laughs> slamming Andy Dick's head into the bar. <laughs> oh my God, John Lovitz. <laughs> so here's the thing. If I cringe when I watch Love It, now you will picture him slamming I, Andy Dixon. And... Right. <laughs> and I cannot watch, like, I will turn off things with Andy Dick in it. <laughs> I can't stand Andy Dick. I disliked Love It and I could struggle through it. 
hated Andy Dick. <laughs> and now you will hate him even more. <laughs> now that I know this, I like John Lovitz a little <laughs> bit more. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Andy Dick always said it wasn't his fault. And uh, so here's the thing, though. While I, I definitely don't like Andy Dick. <laughs> what? I didn't know that. <laughs> it wasn't clear. <laughs> I understand that John's was hurt and wanting to blame somebody for the death. And it's just, it's so hard to wrap your head around so, a friend's death and to know where to play. People, they try it and makes place you feel blame. better when you try to place blame, but really it doesn't always need to be placed. Exactly. The reality is she was addicted to drugs. She, it, they were not good choices. And yes, Andy Dick was probably not a great influence, but she was still making those choices herself. Oh, well, exactly. Um, so I, I don't, I don't And if hold... he didn't introduce it to her, she probably would have gotten it elsewhere anyways. So exactly. That, and I mean, this is like the 90s. Everyone's doing coke. Like, it's just kind of, you know what it I mean? It was like, just there. Yeah. So Bryn's sister and her husband ended up raising the children for them after their death. Uh, the children share an inheritance of $1.23 million from Phil's... Uh, estate which they will get on their 25th birthday which I don't know like I think they're probably at that point now or very close to it because they were it was in the 90s oh yeah they should probably maybe be there or yeah close to yeah so um Phil's death was really hard on the acting family because they had just lost Chris Farley like so uh. Chris Farley died in December this happened in May Oh, so gosh. this was, yeah, was six so months that's apart. why everyone was like, John Lovitz was probably like that freaking out. Exactly. Even more. Yeah. Um, so. And they were both like, there's skits of Chris Farley and uh, John Lovitz. Like, there's a lot of skits between the two of them, right? So there's a lot of memories and history between the Aww, two. That's tough. When he passed, Matt Groening, re- Matt Groening retired. So I didn't even notice. Did you notice that Troy McClure disappeared? Nope. Nope. <laughs> Me neither, but he did. Oh. And they did. They, he, they, they just, just stopped, stopped the character altogether. They just stopped altogether. Uh, the day of his death, they canceled all rehearsals for The Simpsons. The Groundlings, the troupe that he had originally started with, they canceled their show for that day. Um, and News Radio, when they came back for the next season, which I think might have been their final season anyway, in the first episode, they did. They addressed his death as his character had died. So they were able to properly mourn him as an actor on the show. For his character. I think it's so sad. It's so good when they do that. Did you ever watch uh, Eight Slumber Rolls for Dating My Teenage yes. Daughter? Yes. Did you see the episode after he died? Mm, yeah. Oh, I oh. watched that a long time ago, but yeah. Oh, I would ball. It's so funny. I talked about something similar in mine. <laughs> John Ritter. Oh, yeah. do you? Yeah. That's funny. Um, yeah, that was a really good show. But it was I so think, good. I, I want to say I did watch that because I remember feeling pretty emotional. It was watching so, one of those episodes. I just don't recall all the details. Well, so it was the same. Um, so, but I think with so with eight simple rules, it happened right before they were about to start filming again. That he had died, and they wrote him off as he had went to the store and either got into a car accident oh, or had right. a heart attack or something. Uh, so, it, like the emotion was very very, very raw for the entire cast. It was uh. really really hard to watch. So yeah, these the people on news radio did the same thing and really honored honored his life's work by doing the same for his character's death. Uh, SNL actually went as far as to dedicate an entire episode to just clips of him and his skits. And I saw a clip, but I can't find it again. Of Steve Martin actually stood up and honored him in wow. in some of it as well. Maxim titled him the top as Saturday Night Live performer of all time, and Small Soldiers was his last movie. That he ever did. Damn. Yeah. After his death, he was inducted into the Canada Walk of Fame and the Hollywood Walk of Fame. And while I was doing my research, I actually came across some stuff I did not realize that Joe Rogan and him were friends. What? Yeah. So the, if you look it up, there's, if you just put in Phil Hartman, Joe Rogan on YouTube pops up a bunch of times because he, in his podcast, he talks, talks about, about him. him. And Aww. yeah, it's really sweet. Just different stories of, of just shit they did it was fantastic it was really nice so when you think of all the brilliant names that came out of saturday night live he basically worked with all of them wow he was after belushi but and john candy i think i don't think he ever crossed with john candy but like bill murray steve uh steve martin chris farley danny devito adam sandler eddie murphy 
You could literally go on for on and on hours. And on. There's probably nobody in Hollywood that he didn't interact with. Wow. Yeah. So, to give you a better list of the things you didn't realize Phil Hartman was a part of from your childhood. Here we go. Oh, here we go. Cheech and Chong's next movie. Okay. The Brave Little Toaster. <laughs> <laughs> Page Master. Stuart Saves His Family. The Jetsons. DuckTales. Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventures. Tailspin. Tiny Toon Adventures. Captain Planet. Darkwing Duck. Tom and Jerry Kids. Eat the Cat. Animaniacs, Caroline in the City, Gargoyles, Ren and Stimpy, Seinfeld, Third Rock from the Sun. Wow. And that's just the ones that stood out. Animaniacs. I know. (laughs) But those are just the ones that that stood out to me as ones that I remembered from my childhood. I'm sure there were ones that are on the list that that you would have known that I just didn't list because I didn't know what the fuck they were. (laughs) (laughs) That's fair. Wow. Um, Yeah. So that is the story of, the sad story of Phil Hartman's life. Or death. Because he had a fantastic life. Yeah, I suppose. Except for maybe some of his home stuff. Yeah. Aw. Yeah. I'm sorry, buddy. (laughs) Is that not sad? I was sitting there last night, like, just, I get like that, right? When you start looking at someone's life and going, they're gone. It's the same with Robin Williams. I watch a Robin Williams movie and I cry. Aw. (laughs) Yeah. Aw, that's sad. Yeah. Especially, yeah, he obviously brought a lot of joy to lots of people. And was fine with not really being like uh, yeah like the focus of it like all the other names I know but his not so much but he was still considered the glue that held everyone together so yeah. that's pretty amazing like very what do I want to say not selfless but just very like yeah I'm assuming yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and that's what people would say about him he very much like he supported his castmates and would help people and never really asked for anything in return he was just that guy. So, Aww. well, rest in peace, Phil. Yeah. So that is the story of Phil Hartman, and I do. I feel bad as well for his wife, because yes, she committed murder. Yes, she killed her husband. But there's obviously something else going on there, and uh, again, mine also Absolutely. talks about medication, so I'm like, we're kind of overlapping here. <laughs> well, oddly enough, but uh, yeah, like being on antidepressants and it's sometimes yeah. just giving her free samples and she wasn't being followed and she's obviously already struggling with mental health and addictions prior to that like that can really affect your frontal Absolutely. lobe and your decision making and your empathy and yep. like your reactions to things so um it, that also like it might have just been out of her control yep doesn't make it any better but no I absolutely mean, not there's more happening there yeah so i uh i do i feel sad that that is the reality that she probably because honestly if you think about it if she was on cocaine and drinking and on medications she commits the crime at 3 a.m they come back to the house realistically three to six hours later all of that's wearing off at that point and now she's looking at what she did and the reality of what she did and that would have been the most awful feeling ever i could not imagine Ugh. i couldn't imagine that not only seeing the love of your life dead and realizing you did it that's just it's terrible yeah oh, well <sighs> well now Thanks that i've such... depressed everybody <laughs> for wednesday night <laughs> oh you just wait next wednesday you'll be just as sad <laughs> <laughs> this was uh, a very depressing topic <laughs> yeah well, i think it all is but <laughs> very much so yeah so yeah Okay. Well, well, thanks for sharing the story. No problem. <laughs> all right, guys. I hope you all have a great week. And uh, Sheena, don't die. Okay. <laughs> Bye, guys. Bye.